as I said in my own institution, the professors were saying, or do we really have to change? Do we have to break down the law codes? But after a while, <coughs> they were no longer questioning if it was a good idea or a bad idea. They were saying, okay, teachers have the right to learn the law codes. We are, we are convinced. And likewise, in all of the literature, it's not the whole question of whether Bologna is a good idea or a bad idea. Because most people believe it's a very good idea for a university like this to have our degree courses described at an international level, to bring in students from other countries to attend courses that are recognized here at university level. So the key question that I now want to answer is how do I write learning outcomes? And in fact, it's very easy. And so you have the lovely green fields in the background. So there are good times ahead. And we're very fortunate that this man here, called Benjamin Luton, left us the toolkit for writing learning outcomes. Lou did his bachelor's degree in education and his master's degree in education in Penn State University in the United States. He went on then to do his PhD in education and he walked up to a very famous educationist called Ralph Tyler when he was doing his PhD in the University of Chicago. By all accounts, Lou was a very good teacher. He liked to be in the lecture theatre, explaining things to his students. And when he was standing there in the lecture theatre, in front of the students, there was always one question that time and time again came back into his mind. And that one question was, are these students really thinking about what I'm saying to them? Or are they just sitting there taking the notes and I'm not succeeding in getting them to think? Do this PhD in that area? And he published what is probably one of the most important books ever written in the field of education, Bloom's Taxonomy of Educational Objectives. When I was being trained as a teacher way back in the late 70s, we learned about the work of Bloom. And here we are, over 50 years, 60 years after Newton has done his work and we're still referring back to his book. So one of the famous books ever written. What was the book about? Newton said that when our students are learning new materials, their minds go through various thought processes. Starting first, of course, with the knowledge. We give our students the knowledge, because without knowledge, nothing is possible. The next step then is for our students to try to understand the knowledge that we give them. If they understand the knowledge, they should be able to apply that knowledge to other situations. If they can apply the knowledge, they should also be able to analyze various material and they should be able to put together various strands from different other forms of knowledge. And finally, at the very top of this taxonomy or list or hierarchy, the students should be able to stand back and look at everything we've taught them the budget and evaluate 
examples of learning our goals. Again, notice they all begin with the active verb and they go right across all of the subject areas. Very soon. And now we're starting to move up into the higher order thinking skills. This is where things can get a bit difficult for our students. So if we write an examination question using the word analyze, then this is expecting students to build on the knowledge, the comprehension, the application. Lewis taxonomy is a hierarchy. In other words, you cannot analyze unless you can apply. You cannot apply unless you can understand, and you cannot understand unless you have the knowledge to give. So everything in Lewis taxonomy is built on this hierarchy. And then those examples of learning outcomes in the area of analysis are all very straightforward. As I say, you can take away this PowerPoint presentation and study these at your leisure. And now we're going to synthesize things. It's getting even harder for the students because they have to pull together parts from different areas of the module or of the entire course that you are taught. Again, you lived behind some action verbs. Now, if you've been watching closely, you might have noticed that some words can be common to more than one. So if you have the same word, turn it on twice, sometimes even three times. Because it depends on the context. Let me give you an example. Suppose if you look at application there, if I am teaching mathematics, I can write an examination question which says, using the formula t equals 2 pi times the square root of l over g, calculate the periodic time of the pendulum of a ground point. There, all the students can do is apply their knowledge calculations. So they just put in the value and walk up the value with periodic time. However, if I give them the same mathematical equation, the same mathematical problem, but do not give them the equation, they have to read through the problem. They have to analyze the problem in order to calculate the periodic time. So they have to analyze the problem in order to decide what's the best formula to use. So the same verb, calculate, can be used in both application and analysis. But the context can be different. Okay? So that's very much uh, uh, the, uh, quite common. So now we look at synthesis, and again, many examples of synthesis. In very and finally, we're at the very top of the whole area of evaluation. And in evaluation, we are really expecting a lot of the students. We're expecting them to sit back and look at everything that we've talked with them and try to make sense of it. So asking students to summarize things is a good way to get them thinking and evaluating the world or something. So if you say, I want you to summarize that module in just five pages of bullet points, then you are expecting the students to be able to pick out what is important and what is not important. Now in 2001, Two years after Putin died, a book came out of Mathis Taxonomy, written by these two characters. And what they did was, in the book, they looked at Putin's taxonomy to see did it need to be changed or updated. And I remember buying the book because, you know, after 50 years of Putin's taxonomy, 
it would be interesting to see what changes were recommended. Well, it really was a waste of my 50 euros because they spent the whole book talking about whether evaluation should be there and whether synthesis should be done here, whether these two should be swapped. But it did show me that Bloom's taxonomy had stood the test of time. I don't think Bloom could have approved this. It, these were the four things for the taxonomy, you know, so the create instead of evaluation. But if you look at the literature, the original Bloom's taxonomy is the one that everybody goes back and calls. It's a bit like the original, you know, the original Coca-Cola. There are many people who try to copy it, but people still prefer the original. And it's much the same with Bloom. He, Bloom, I don't think he would have approved of it. Uh, and it was a bit unfair, I suppose, the way that he died before they tried to mess around his taxonomy. But Bloom's original taxonomy is the one that's most often. Now, all of what I've been saying about Bloom so far has been in an area called the cognitive domain, analysis, synthesis, and so on. They all involve the mind, thinking. But some of you are involved in teaching students who end up in the professions. Is there anybody here, say, from law, the legal profession? Any law practicing members here? No. Have we anyone from a medical profession? <laughs> medical department, right? Okay. So he be turning on students who will be dealing with people in hospitals, patients, and so on. And this is often referred to as the affect domain, where you are really dealing with value issues, ethics, patient confidentiality, for example. And you wrote a second book, a year after the first book, on the affective domain. And examples of their long columns in the affective domain deal with things like ethics, confidentiality, communication. You know? There's no point in a doctor having all the medical knowledge if they cannot communicate well with the patient, if they haven't got personality. No. So these are areas where when you're writing their long columns from modules in which students will be dealing with people when they graduate, this is an area you should always give consideration to. So uh, for example, social sciences. We went to hear the social sciences. Okay. That was written by one of our social science professors where you have a social worker and children at risk are taken into care. So embracing a responsibility, for example. Now, you might identify one final area. It's a funny word in the English language, psychomotor. Psycho-mind motor movement. It deals with coordination skills, for example. It applies to the laboratory and it applies to clinical skills. So this is one of the ones written by one of our professors of uh, medicine in my own university. So this is one of the learning outcomes where uh, students would be assessed on their clinical skills, their ability to diagnose a particular disease or ailment in a patient. Okay. And obviously, in the area of surgery, there would be also skills involved. Now, many of you could have a learning outlook in terms of presentation skills. After coffee, we'll be talking about assessment. And this is a very good way of assessing our students to ask them to make a presentation to their peers, for example. Now, what does a module look like? By university. Well, these are the outcomes written for a module by Eleanor Sullivan. Eleanor lectures in dentistry, and she was one of the professors who 
did have a master's in teaching and learning in our university. We have a situation in Ireland where to teach in a kindergarten you must be a qualified teacher. To teach in elementary school you must be a qualified teacher. To teach in high school you must be a qualified teacher. But to teach at university, anyone can teach. Mm -hmm. So we have a situation where the people come in to give mm -hmm. a lecture, but they receive no training mm -hmm. on how to be a teacher. So arising out of the Bologna process, we set up formal qualifications. And I'll speak about those in the second presentation. But Eleanor did her master's degree in teaching and learning in higher education. Now, so the, the literature tells us that a module should be described with a maximum of eight learning outcomes. We allow our professors to go as far as nine. Now, <coughs> these are five year dated students, five there is our fifth year. And if you look at the learning outcomes, they are very limited because here you have summarized higher order thinking skills. So these five year dental students must be able to learn more on the biochemistry that they've learned, the microbiology, the anatomy, the physiology, drawing all those in the final year to treat a patient well. Now, even in advertising in our newspapers, you see there are no if you do this course, at the end of it, 